all grown up with Google. You know Google extremely well. Um, if I Google for network computer systems at UCL, it comes back with a whole bunch of things. Unfortunately, it finds our, our web page at the top of the list. But there's one thing I want to point out on here. This number. There's about 45 billion web pages out there. And Google manages to search 45 billion web pages in under half a second. I don't know about you, but I find that astounding. It's amazing, because it's really, you can't go to disk to do that. It's got to be done out of memory on these machines. So what they actually do is your search, your little search goes out to 5,000 machines within Google's network simultaneously. They all crunch one 5,000th of the index. They put that information back together and return it to you. And they do it all in under half a second. That's pretty impressive. It's really hard to do that sort of stuff. So sort of things that we talk about on our, our course on mobile and cloud computing is how do Google do this? And it's, you know, some of the algorithms are quite simple. Some of them are really complicated. But this is the sort of, of question that the people on our course are really interested in understanding the answer to. I'll give you another example. Um, I'm going to talk about wireless. This particular slide at the top is uh, an experimental wireless setup we've got going on for some of the research here. It has software-defined radio, multiple antennas, and things like that. Um, and that kind of thing is part of the sort of wireless solution. So if you look back to 2000, a good, fast Wi-Fi network will give you about 5 megabits per second. If you look at the state of the art today, a good, fast Wi-Fi network will give you 900 megabits per second. So 13 years, we've improved by more than a factor of 100. And yet, the laws of physics haven't changed. What you can actually get through the spectrum hasn't changed. We've just got a lot smarter about how we actually use spectrum. In particular, to, in 2000, wireless used to be the province of the guys next door in electronic engineering. Now, wireless is a computer science subject because we're applying a lot of algorithms to how to extract information from the data stream and so forth. It's really about processing and the processing you can apply to the data. And that's how you get these kind of speed ups in only a decade or so. Another example. Here we have a, a high-end video conference suite. Conferencing suite. Um, the, um, if you look at the sort of the data rate for video at full high definition, the raw data rate for high definition video, the sort of thing this conferencing suite does multiple lots of, is about three gigabits per second. Okay, that's a pretty high data rate. If you look at what they're actually transmitting with a modern video compression algorithm, we're getting good quality, high definition, live, interactive video conferencing at three megabits per second. Okay, three orders of magnitude. So where did the other 99.9% .9 of the data go? It's a pretty good question. It's really hard to do that. You can't see the difference, or you can barely see the difference between the full three gigabits per second and three megabits per second. And that's a pretty impressive result. It's really some very smart algorithms go on there. And this is the sort of thing that we discuss on our, on our course on um, multimedia systems that, that I teach. Another example here. If you looked at the news this morning, um, the, um, there was a big fuss because in Korea, most of the main media networks and some of the banks went down. Still speculation at the moment about exactly where it came from, but you can probably guess. Somewhere a little bit north of the border is the expectation. Um, so the first question is, how did the bad guys do that? And this is the sort of question that we look at on our, on our course on distributed systems and security. So much the system security side of it, not the crypto side that uh, David talked about earlier. But perhaps a more interesting question is not, how did the bad guys do that, although we will teach you that. Um, but how do you design systems that are resilient to that? When somebody actually manages to exploit your software, how do you avoid the bad consequences that follow? And you can do that by various methods of containment and things like that. So this is the sort of techniques we discuss where the current state of the art is in protecting systems, not just like the crunchy outside, but how do you make sure that you've got defense in depth so that when you get owned, which you will eventually, nothing bad happens. Um, obviously, the... Uh, the difference between the state of the art in the research world and the state of the art in what's actually deployed is somewhat apart at the moment. Um, one more question. If you look at how the internet is like has, um, according to data release this morning, more than 1.3 billion active IP addresses at any one moment in time. That's an awful lot. Yet nobody tells anybody how fast to send. Each individual sender makes up their own mind how fast to send through the network. There's no centralized control. There's no centralized control over routing. There's no centralized control over data rates or anything like that. 
And so a really good question is, how do you manage to come up with completely distributed algorithms that do that? So this is a little animation of um, traffic going through the network. So this sender here is sending data to this one down here. And what it's doing is it's locally trying to figure out, this is the bottleneck link. And you can see a queue starts to build here as you send too much traffic. And oops, a whole bunch of packets got dropped on the floor. Um, so this is how the network actually figures out how fast to send. Nobody tells it. It has no idea what the right data rate here is until it tries. And it probes and finds out. Now, of course, it can do that by itself. But this is a network of billions of users, billions of flows. And they've all got to play together. So what happens is that sooner or later, there's a red packet, which is coming from this guy to here. And that will start up. And no, these two flows don't even know each other's there. But they interact with each other, and they both explore. And eventually, and it'll take a little time, they will converge on a reasonably fair solution, despite the fact that each doesn't know the other's there. And nobody's told them how fast the network is. This is really kind of cute. Um, the basics of this algorithm actually date back to the 1980s, but there's been many small changes over the years. And just the subtle dynamics of this and how what this is doing interacts with things like video conferencing and telephony and so forth, which are on the same network these days, is really interesting and subtle. And so these are the sort of questions that we, we go through on the different courses that we have on, on the masses in network computing systems. I should probably say a few words about the the group here. The Networks Research Group at UCL um, has been around for a while. Um, we were the first site on the ARPANET, which is the thing that became the internet before it was called the internet in 1973. You are here. <laughs> That's a map of the ARPANET in 1973. You can't, nobody has done a map of the internet for the last 10 years because nobody can. And even the ones from 10 years ago are out of date drastically. Um, but that's what it was like. Um, so this is the sort of research we've been doing for a long time. We've got a lot of depth in this, uh, in this area. The, the main people who, will, who teach here, if you, uh, if you come here, are, are myself and uh, four other colleagues who are the, the core of the Networks Research Group. And I encourage you to Google for us. You know, look us up on Google Scholar or things like that. Find out what we do. Um, but between us, we've got 56,000 citations when I checked this morning, um, which is, you know, citation is when somebody references your research work, which is a pretty big number. Um, you won't find any other research group in Europe who have these kind of uh, results. But we also got, we're not just producing academic research, we do practical stuff. So for example, I designed a protocol called SIP. Some of you might have heard of it. It's used for setting up interactive uh, sessions, internet telephony, things like that. Um, Anybody ever used uh, FaceTime on one of these? Well, FaceTime behind the scenes uses SIP to set up stuff. That high-end Cisco video conferencing suite that I showed you earlier, that uses SIP to set up all the sessions and so forth. So we do a lot of academic research, but we also do a lot of practical stuff. Get the protocols out there into the real world, really build systems, get them standardized, and get them deployed. And so if you come here and do this master's program, this is the sort of people who will be uh, teaching on the course, and it's a lot of fun. We, we get into these really interesting questions of how do we build these really complex big networks.